Hi, I'm Derek Mills. Welcome back to Professor Christopher Chappell's lectures about the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Let's continue with the next lecture. The so-called initiator, the Purusha, is the one mind among many that is distinct from activity. Therein, what is born of meditation is without residue. Pravirti bedhe prayojikam chittam ekam anekasham. Pravitti bedhe prayojikam chittam ekam anekas kesam. Pravitti bedhe prayojikam chittam ekam anekasam. Tatra dhyana jam anashayam. Tatra dhyana jam anashayam. Tatra dhyana jam anashayam. Okay, why, why, why do we do anything? Everything that we undertake, everything that we experience, every smell that causes either recoil or rejoicing, every flavor, salty, bitter, pungent, sweet, every form, every color that graces the eye, every texture we feel rough, smooth, alluring, every sound, soft, medium, or loud, all of this realm of the sensorium provides experience for that presence that remains undisturbed, no matter what's put upon it, for that presence that doesn't change, yet serves as the pole star around which all of the variant constellations, all of the gradations of brightness, all of the different subtle hues, they all revolve around this aspect of our being, this consciousness that receives but does not complain. This consciousness remains ever distinct and aloof, but rather than seeing this consciousness as something that, oh, why don't you care about me? We can choose to see this consciousness as ever present, requiring our acknowledgement and recognition. Now there's an African folk tale that I'd like to share to try to get a sense of why we don't feel that wonderful silence at all moments. And it's a fable. We'll pull it apart a little bit. But in the old days, 
the elders speak, many, many years ago. Their presence, their awareness, their consciousness dwelt right upon our shoulders. And in fact, it streamed from the heavens above, just sort of taking out the silhouette of the human shape, but supporting that human from below, surrounding this human with an enduring embrace, and available to that person right here, so that whenever a question arose, like what is the true meaning of life? You just look over here and I am the true meaning of life. The silent voice would reassure, I'm always here, you're always protected, you always have me as your ground, as your breath, Inspiration and aspiration joined together, and human life experienced an enduring golden age. But one family, one family became very worried. They doubted the assurance they could not hear or feel that enduring presence. And they became very concerned about gathering enough food. And as some ancient literature still recalls, there was a time in the Bible, the time of Garden of Eden, in Hindu tradition, a time narrated in the Mahabharata, when, when humans were hungry, they just simply went into the forest and found all of their needs. Fruits and vegetables gave full sustenance, always available. But this one family did not trust that the food would be there when they needed the food. And they found a very particular type of grain that required a fair amount of processing, but also would stay, would fill a granary, and would be available whenever they would need food, right within their own village. So, the whole family went about the task of gathering as much of this grain as they could and then pounding it, pounding it, and pounding it so they could store it to make sure that they would have enough food. But every time they pounded that grain and brought the pestle down on the mortar, brought the pestle down on the mortar, they hit God in the face. And after a period of time, this presence, which was always available, retreated and retreated. And with every blow of the pestle of human greed, with every blow of the pestle of human anxiety, drifted higher and higher and higher above, leaving people without the assurance of the presence, without the assurance that it's really okay, and left people competing, greedy, consumerist, anxious, and worried. So this metaphor that comes to us from Africa becomes a metaphor for the human predicament. 
that we spend so much time gathering and processing, consuming and discarding, that we lose sight of that one mind always available to us. As long as we remain engaged in the realm of activity, as long as we're in the coming and going of tamas, raja, sattva, tamas, raja, sattva, got to have this, got to do this, got to rest, got to keep going, without interruption, without taking that pause that that refreshes, then we lose the ability to understand why all of this is happening. All of this is happening. All of this has been initiated within the realm of Prakriti, within our goddess and self-constructed world, for the sake of remembering, for the sake of experiencing that quiet and that calm. Now the second sutra of this cluster says that whenever we go into that place of calm, Whenever we take the time for considered regard, which is another way to think about dhyana, dhi, samadhi, dhyana, extended, considered regard. Whenever we go into that sacred space of meditation, two things happen. One, a little bit of our klishta karmas fall away. And two, in that protected space of meditation, we don't generate, we don't attract more karmic material. And this provides a little bit of a connection with the Jain theory of karma. That karmas have a crystalline form that can be colorful, that are sticky. And in the Jain narrative about how karmas congeal, it states that whenever the vow of nonviolence is violated, Whenever one tells a lie, whenever one steals, whenever one engages in non-appropriate, inappropriate sexual behavior, whenever one hoards a bunch of stuff to prop up sense of self, that in addition to those immediate tangibles that little particles adhere to and design a personality correlate to those desires and that that becomes quite literally a cloak that hides, that covers our true light. And whenever we go into that sacred bodily space of meditation, we prevent that stuff, those particles, from landing on us. And in that meditation, we work in such a way that a few of those klishta karmas, whether a little bit of our ignorance a little bit of our egotism, a little bit of our addictive propensities, a little bit of our hatred, a little bit of our, geez, I really got to just keep going. All of that begins to lighten. 
all of that begins to become less burdensome. So the challenge becomes for yoga teachers, how can I introduce this type of teaching about karma in a way that will make sense in the lives of my students? Now in India, the metaphors, darkness and light, seed, water, growing plants, okay, the metaphors are sparing. And in our culture, global culture today, we have the metaphors provided by media and we have the metaphor of media itself. So we can perhaps remind our students of the telephone, now the cell phone, and about the seeming individuality, the different apps that each of us choose, the different websites that we each visit, and ask our students to see all of this in terms of the agricultural metaphor of seeds being planted that are then called into awareness into, albeit a virtual reality, but increasingly with high definition resolution, with the personalization of media delivery systems, more and more this metaphor for metaphors is becoming the definitive way of regarding reality. And we can point that out to our students that even though the documentary may stoke up a little bit of emotion about one issue or another, that until you're face-to-face -face providing direct service to those who suffer from famine, those millions and millions who are displaced, for a whole variety of reasons worldwide, displaced from housing, displaced from their particular region due to drought or famine or political upset. And that even if you're not able to be there in the material, that there may be some way for you to let some of your material wealth be used by those people that you see that you are now connected with through this media. And then think about the worlds that we choose to inhabit, okay? the worlds that have been created, the worlds that we support, and the worlds that could use our goodwill and our good energy. However, in order to move through those metaphors into realities in order to truly understand and come out of complacency into a place of usefulness, there needs to be the capacity of discernment. There needs to be a clear mind that can interpret the information decide which reality must be affirmed, and then with reason and discernment, choose a pathway through which the residue, whatever that residue may be, whether residue of egotism, whether residue of consumerism, whether residue of hatred, find a way to clear that residue. And through that process, one's personal reality connects with a larger reality informed not by mindless activity, but informed by discernment that comes 
from a place of deep silence that comes from a place of meditation, that comes from a place without the residue, allowing through yoga for a very healthy connection to be made, a connection that benefits both all of the activities attached to and covering over ourself with encouragement to others to similarly stop, pause, appreciate, move forward, and move upward. The action of a yogi is neither black nor white. That of others is threefold, black, white, and mixed. Hence, the emergence of habit patterns corresponds to fruition of karmas. Because memory and residues of karma are of one form, there are links even among births, places, and times that are concealed. And there is no beginning of these due to the perpetuity of desire. Because they are held together by causes, results, correspondences, and supports, when these disappear, there is the non-being of the residues of karma. In their true form, past and future exist because dharmas have distinct paths. These dharmas have subtle and manifest qualities of nature. Karma, Ashukla, Akrishnam, Yoganas, Trividam Itaresham, Karma, Ashukla, Akrishnam, Yoganas, Trividam Itaresham, Karma, Ashukla, Akrishnam, Yoganas, Trividam Itaresham, Tatas Tad Vipaka, Anugunanam eva abhivyaktir vasanam. Tatas tad vipaka anugunanam eva abhivyaktir vasananam. Tatas tad vipaka anugunanam eva abhivyaktir vasananam. Jati desha kala vyavahitanam apyanantaryam smriti samskarayor eka rupatvat. Jati desha kala vyavahitanam apyanantaryam smriti samskarayor eka rupatvat. Jati desha kala Vyavahitanam apyanantaryam smriti samskarayor eka rupatvat. Tasam anaritvam cha ashisho nityatvat. Tasam anaritvam cha ashisho nityatvat. Tasam anaritvam cha ashisho nityatvat. He tu pala ashraya alambanaiha sam girhitvatvad esham abhave tadabhavaha. He tu pala ashraya alambanaiha sam girhitvatvad Esham abave tadabhavaha. He tu pala ashraya 
alambanai ha samgirt hi tatvad esham abave tarabhavaha atita anagatam svarupato stya dva bedad dharma nam atita anagatam svarupato styadva bedad dharmanam atita anagatam svarupato styadva bedad dharmanam te vyakta sukshma guna atmanaha te vyakta sukshma guna atmanaha te vyakta sukshma guna atmanaha okay this cluster of sutras describes the operations of karma and it begins by saying that for a yogi ashukla there is no white for a yogi there is no krishna there is no black for ordinary people their karma a little bit black a little bit white a little bit mixed but a yogi a true yogi a person in a place of meditation a person dwelling in that zone where there is no outward flow there is no inward flow that person remains untouched by karma during those moments of yoga for everybody else out and about working the field planting seeds in the field of karma waiting for the crop to come waiting for that programming within the seed to take root to sprout to blossom to fructify all of that dance happens because of the activities that we choose the activities we seed the activities that as we see sometimes remain unknown sometimes are concealed but because all of the varietals all of the different species of karmas in which we participate they all eventually will return they all eventually will in fact make themselves manifest and no matter how much we want to trace back every single one they've been around for so long our desires are so vast our desires are so remarkably without limit as the buddha said ignorance has no beginning but ignorance has an end meditation can cleanse it all meditation can deliver a person into a place of calm free from the thrum and the throb of the karmas but they've been with us from before beginningless time furthermore by examining the seeds of action examining how they function we see that they provide cause they see that they provide result we see that they arise from all manner of correspondences and we see that they both provide and they require 
all manner of supports. But slowly, slowly, each of those, through considered reflection, through the application of Viveka Kyati, can be rendered void, can be placed in a place of stillness, and eventually the result no longer appears. The cause, that samskara, no longer pertains. The correspondences and those supports, those side pillars and those direct pillars, they too can slowly, slowly be disassembled. We know from the observance of the human experience, and we know from narratives that surround us that yes, there has been a past. That past informs us, that past provides the raw material for understanding the history, understanding the story. And from experience, we know that the future is real because if someone creates a situation that causes you to hurt, that you're going to remember that hurt and carry that hurt over into the future until it becomes resolved. Every dharma, every existing point of reality has its own path and requires our steady, careful attention. Furthermore, emphasizing what has been clearly stated in the prior padas, these dharmas, these marks that distinguish an experience one from another as a subtle aspect, a samskara, a vasana, and it has a manifest aspect, connecting within the realm of emotion, connecting within the realm of physical realities. Now this approach to yoga through understanding karma has been explained very succinctly with many layers of real meaning. And what we find posited is the stuff of karma is as real as real can be. That the coding for what we experience is planted with seeds that come into fruition. Psychologists know this very, very well. And in the 1950s, a marriage came about between the psychologists and the marketers. Psychologists knowing what lies in the unconscious, those driving desires, and the marketers interested in connecting with those desires so those desires can be dealt with through purchase. And a marketer literally is in the business of sowing seeds of desire so that people will chase after and pay money 
in order to obtain a consumer good or a consumer experience that will provide to them the safety, the quiet comfort that they think, or at least they've been told, they can buy if they buy a particular product. Now, yoga has not been immune from this. Many, many yoga products adorn studios, adorn bodies, all with trying to cash in on this notion that we can come to a place of calm. But so has always been the case. Humans, from the beginning of time, have looked up at the heavens, have examined their bodies, and said, how can we make sense of this? And we look at the monuments, such as Stonehenge, the pyramids, Notre Dame Cathedral, the Taj Mahal, the imperial palaces of China, on and on, all through the world, the Hindu temples of Angkor Wat, all through the world, great edifice, edifices created at great expense in order to allow the human person to get a glimpse of beauty, to get a glimpse of peace. Interesting how the human craft vitiated with klesha karma can lead very much to the mundane, to the pedestrian, to the venial. But human desire can also lead, as Socrates said, to the good, the true, the beautiful. And as a yoga teacher, what you can do is ask your students to think about karma, to think about how an intention here becomes an action here with a result over here. The opening lines of the Dhammapada state that good results follow an act of good just as the wheel of a chariot follows the horse. Likewise, seeds of ill intent result in suffering. And then the students perhaps can be asked to have a little conversation with one another, or even to write in their journals or with the larger group about how something within their life has been scripted by someone else. Because so much of what we experience is pre-arranged karmic activity that has been designed by culture, that has been, been designed by marketers, whereby these people, knowing all of the different variations of human desire, have created goods to catch your eye, for you to open your financial resources to share with them. And the whole economies, whole worlds are built on the stoking up of the karmic field. What an amazing metaphor universal application, the field, the field of the karmic seed is the field of our many, many experiences. To walk through that field, to discern the weeds from the useful, to discern through that cycle the choices made by the individual in the context of a larger cultural context of 
a vast field. Hey, all of this provides an invitation for self-reflection. Karma theory, endlessly fascinating, now part of, really, global discourse, and connects with, really, all of the ethical systems worldwide, that if you perform this behavior, this will result. And within yoga, the encouragement and the wisdom that the purification of karmas will lead to a place of quiet, will lead to a place of calm, and will allow one to move beyond all of the changes of karma into moments of quiet, moments of stability, and moments of peace. From the uniformity of its perinama, matter has thatness. And the distinctness of matter from the mind, there is a separate path of each. Matter does not depend on one mind. There is no proof of this. How could it be? Matter is known or not known due to the anticipation that colors the mind. Harinama ekatvat vastu tatvam Harinama ekatvat vastu tatvam Harinama ekatvat vastu tatvam Vastu samye chidabedat tayor vibhaktaha pantaha Vastu samye chidabedat tayor vibhaktaha pantaha Vastu samye chidabedat tayor vibhaktaha pantaha Na cha eka chitta tantram vastu tad apramanakam tadakim syat Na cha eka chitta tantram vastu tad apramanakam tada kim sya da cha eka chitta tantram vastu tad apramanakam tada kim sya tad uparaga apeksha tvach chitasya vastu jnana ajnyatam tad uparaga apeksha tvach Chitasya vastu jnana ajnya na tam. Tad uparaga apekshit vach. Chitasya vastu jnana ajnya tam. Now, this particular cluster is staking a claim on reality. Sankhya and yoga declare emphatically that things have thingness, that matter has thatness, and that, yes, there's a cascade that is propelled by the residues of past action, pushing through the senses, and the object is actually real. And whether we choose to attend to that object or not, it is real. So a cup is a cup. It has cupness. It's different from the mind. And every object, every vastu, has its own presence, its own reality, its own constitution, its own granularity, 
And furthermore, matter does not proceed from a singular mind. Matter has always been multiple, has always expressed itself, according to Sankhya, through the gunas of heaviness, activity, and luminosity, tamas, rajas, and sattva. But it's always been here. It did not come from a creator source. And Sankhya, and particularly Patanjali, poses the rhetorical question, how can you prove that? No one can see where this place of origin, of particularity, we can't find it. Nonetheless, simultaneously, yoga affirms the presence of the human mind in the co-creation of the world experienced. And it says that matter is known or not known according to the anticipation that colors the mind, that tinges the mind based, as we have seen, on the trove of samskaras, of vasanas, of impressions from past action. So with this object, a rather handsome, hexagonically shaped cup, two-toned, two-textured, we have a functionality that brought it not only into the world writ large, but brought it into the world of the speaker here. And it serves the function, providing the vessel so that the tea can be consumed, the throat can be calmed, the system overall can be lubricated, and it arises from a desire, a desire to create the comfort of a beautiful cup, easy to hold, a desire for a speaker to bring some solace to a throat which can become dry. And these anticipations, these colorings, lead to the production and, in a sense, the co-creation of every single received object. Now, it may seem that there's two arguments being made. An argument that, oh yeah, there's an external world, and simultaneously an argument of mentation as determinative, and these are not mutually exclusive. Why is this particular claim being made? Why is it important that physical objects exist? Why is it important that mental states play a role in the experience of these physical objects. Now, the philosophical argument being made is about the reality of suffering, and the argument being made is about giving importance to the material. So the first argument, the argument of singularity to each bundle of matter, states that everything did not arise from a common source and everything does not get reabsorbed into a common source. The consciousness, which in other systems of thought would be that common source, remains separate from the existence of materiality. Okay, so this is not an, illusion, an illusory 
philosophy, but it's a philosophy of realism, of reals. And because experience calls us toward a higher sense of purpose, that experience must be real. The questioning arising from suffering within the human condition must be real in order for the narrative to be explored, in order for the questions of awe and beauty to stoke one in to that mode, that all-important mode of questing, of asking, of investigating. Second, if it can be argued that none of this is real, then rather having it all come from a God source and return to a God source, if none of this is real, another argument could be presented that, well, it doesn't really matter, that there's nothing that's organizing the universe. There's nothing that really calls us to be interested in meaning, that there's nothing other than this materiality, this materiality which is subject to our will, to our use, subject to our abuse, subject to our manipulation, and that whatever we do doesn't matter because everything eventually dies, everything eventually disappears. And rather than going a little bit too much with the God language, this other place goes to a place of meaninglessness, goes to a place of nihilism. And what Sankhya and yoga posit requires a little bit of a, a subtlety of thinking that looks at the layering moving from desire into action to the planting of seeds to the fructification of karma looks to the lessons learned through that process, lessons that eventually will reveal that all of that, all of the twists and the turns of the drama, all of the variegated colors and forms and smells and tastes are in service of in all of their glorious, compelling reality, all are in service of providing experience and freedom. Experience. So the question arises, why do I hurt? and then an examination of all of the past history. At the same time, why is this so beautiful and wonderful? And then an exploration of the quiet that comes from the deep appreciation of beauty. So the reality of the world becomes foundational, remains foundational to the coherence of why yoga functions as it does. Yoga invites people in, invites people to sit, to stand, to breathe, to move, to stretch, to explore the body, to explore the emotions, and yoga affirms every reality, every piece of matter all along the way. Yes, the yoga studio is real. Yes, your klishta karmas are real. Yes, your practice of nonviolence is real. Yes, the choices that you make make a difference. Yes, karma bears results. 
Yes, action has purpose. Emphasizing, affirming, giving meaning to this journey of life and providing tools through all of these explorations to understand karma, to understand our relationship with things and their thingness, to understand our relationship to the cup, to understand our relationship to thirst, to understand our relationship to desire writ large, to understand our desire for transcendence, for calm, and for peace. Now this description of karma offered by Patanjali provides an opportunity for yoga teachers to imaginatively allow their students to examine how the colorations of karma determine their outflows, their parinamas, guiding them toward very specific objects of desire. And students could be invited to think about food. In today's metropolitan cultures worldwide, people have access to flavors from all parts of the globe. And students could be asked to share, what is their favorite? Mexican, Mexican food, tortillas, quesadillas? Is it South Indian food? Doses in Italy and sambar? Is it Italian food? Is it pasta, eggplant rollantini? And then it could go a little bit finer and it could be a conversation about cheeses. Do you like a smoky cheese? Do you like a tart cheddar cheese? Do you like a mild cheddar cheese? And all of these gradations of distinction help define and shape the personality. And then as Ramana Maharshi advised, given all of these choices, giving all of these opportunities to interact with all realms, all different worlds comprised of different colors and shapes and forms of flavors. In the midst of all of that and sorting out, oh yeah, this group of people, they like watermelon. And this group of people, they prefer peaches. Okay, and all of that variegation, all of that variety and all of that multiplicity the question shouts out, who am I? Who am I? And when that question becomes the driving concern, then all of a sudden, watermelon, peaches? This is not a big question. A hybrid or an electric? This is not a big question. The bigger questions come, why do I hunger? Why do I connect with culture, with society, with consumerism in the way that I do? Why? Do I feel an empathy for others that makes my heart tender? Why do those moments of quiet allow an inwardness that refreshes, that restarts, that reboots, my interaction with this realm of matter? How can these experiences 
through the tactile, through the sensory, bring me to a place of understanding. How can my immediate world reflect a sense of greater purpose? Okay, through yoga, through examining and exploring body and breath, through examining thoughts and emotions, through examining action well taken on this ground of understanding of the importance of matter, then slowly, incrementally, and sometimes all at once, it all can make sense. What yoga states, take the world seriously and create a world for yourself in joy. The fluctuations of the mind are always known due to the changelessness of their master, the seer. There is no self-luminosity of those fluctuations because of the nature of the scene. In one circumstance, there is no ascertainment of both fluctuation and consciousness together. In trying to see a special spiritual mind in oneself, there is an overstretching of the intellect and a confusion of memory. Higher awareness does not descend. Any attachment to its form is merely the perception of one's own limited intellect. Sada jnatas chitta vritayas tad prabhoho purushasya a parinama tvat. Sada jnatas chitta vritayas tad prabhoho Purusha are parinamitvat sadajnyatas chitta vritayas tad praboho purushasya are parinamitvat na tat swabasam dershyatvat na tat swabasam dershyatvat na tat swabasam Dershya Tvat Eka Samaye Cha Ubaya An Avadharanam Eka Samaye Cha Ubaya An Avadharanam Eka Samaye Cha Ubaya An Avadharanam Chitta Antara Dershya Budi Buder Ati prasangaha smriti sankarascha chitta antara dushye budi buder adi prasanga smriti sankarascha chitta antara dushye budi buder adi prasangaha smriti sankarascha chitter aprati samkramayas tad akara apatau swabudi samvedanam Chitter aprati samkramayas tad akara apatau svabudi samvedanam. Chitter aprati samkramayas tad akara apatau svabudi samvedanam. This group of sutras establishes transcendence of the transcendent. In other words, there's this aspect of our being 
that remains ever quiet. Not that it's aloof, yet it is aloof. Not that it's disinterested, but it's disinterested. It's constant, it's changeless, it's formless. And yet, we see the change. We see the form. We name, we attempt to name the nameless. We attempt to conceptualize that which cannot be conceived. And just as in the first pada, Patanjali defines Ishvara as untouched by the seeds of karma, untouched by the unfolding development of karma, untouched by the fruits of karma, So also, keeping in mind that definition of this special Purusha, we're in this rather remarkable circumstance of by virtue of our mere life, by by virtue of our mere presence, we have that, we hold that, we feel in our place of deepest intimacy, we feel that witness. We feel that identity that cannot be spoken. And it is because of that enduring, consistent presence of awareness that all of the fluctuations of the mind can be known. One of the great proofs for Purusha from the Sankhya Karika is that all things are organized. All things that can be known are known. Therefore, there must be a knower. So in this collection of sutras that philosophical niche, and in many ways a psychological and even spiritual niche, where the human being feels called into that place of silence. Here, Patanjali gives voice to this reality, at the same time emphasizing its paradoxical nature. So as much as we want to come up with our best narrative, our most heart-filled inspiration for the sublime, for that transcendent, any conceptualization remains that. It remains in the realm of fluctuation. It remains in the realm of vritti, And even the most elevated, the most beautiful presentation seeking to emulate that quiet awareness falls short. And for precisely that reason, many yogis, sadhus, sannyasins will shun the whole world of built religion will refuse to enter into temples, churches, mosques, synagogues, will refuse to participate even in theological discourse or philosophical discourse grounded in the knowledge that any fluctuation is not that is not that, is not able to touch that which cannot be touched. As much as we would love to own and rise up from our meditation and say, oh, I had a great meditation, 
By definition, as soon as that label great goes on, as soon as that naming of meditation goes on, it's no longer great, it's no longer meditation. There's no way that words suffice when it comes to what in the Upanishads becomes coded as number four. Okay, just give it a number, don't go there, don't name it. Such a foundational experience cannot be made profane, cannot be drawn into the realm of rational discourse, cannot be drawn into whatever frame may be attempted, whether it be a statue, whether it be a flower well-placed, whether it be a beautiful hymn, a chant, a mantra even. All of that, all of that attempt to create beauty in the midst of fluctuations remains just that, beauty in the midst of fluctuations. And those people who attempt to put on the cloak of the mysterious, and I've known many people of this sort over the years. Some of them did it with a big wink, and some of them did it saying, I'm going to get everything that I can get out of this. But those people who try to say, oh, I've got a very spiritual, special way of doing things, Okay, that in itself is an overstretching of the intellect, trying to call down from what is above, and it always fails. And, and a confusion of memory, okay? So I learned a little bit of this, I learned a little bit of that. I learned that if you bring in this particular flavor of incense, or if you offer this particular type of food, people are gonna be really interested and they build a religion. And yoga, though taken up throughout history by virtually every world religion, and the history underscores this with abundance, yoga itself decries all of the house of cards that comes into place with the establishment and the maintenance of religious structures. It says quite directly, higher awareness does not descend. That any attachment to any form that's been created in an attempt to honor that higher awareness is not that higher awareness. Now, through the course of religious history, this would be called iconoclasm. This would be called a breaking apart of any icon that any icon must be recognized as a placeholder, and ultimately, as the Buddhists would have it, if you see a Buddha in the road, get rid of it. Right? Sort of stark. And playful. And here, we can turn the corner a little bit and allow all of what religion has to offer to be recognized as play. And this is part of the mystery and the allure of a place like India, and part of why going into a Greek Orthodox church is just so elevating and so entrancing, and why going into Notre Dame, a deeply, deeply calming experience, of course, human beings throughout history have done their best to create environments, to create circumstances that approximate the ultimate. Enjoy that attempt wherever you can find it. 
as a scholar of religion and a teacher of world religions, I've had the gift of visiting through the decades with so many religious leaders of all different faiths. I've had the gift of walking into some of the most, probably the most sublime architectural forms throughout the world. And in each and every instance, there's a lifting up into a space of the sacred, a space of awe, regardless of the context. Now, I'm not saying that all religions are the same. However, with yoga, we find underscored this particular theological, philosophical, psychological, spiritual insight. Every human holds a place of quiet. Every human engages in a realm of activity. The yogi works with that realm of activity to honor, to return to that place of silence. Now, as yoga teachers, you have been gifted with a tremendous responsibility, a personal responsibility to remember what called you to the emotional stability that you have felt, perhaps even fleetingly, but has been given to you through yoga. And it may seem trivial, but remember it, return to it, re-inhabit that quiet space. And then your gift to your yoga students a gift given to you by the people who trained you in yoga, your gift to them invites them through ritual movement of the body, through ritual attention to breath, to enter that state of stillness. And particularly with this cluster of sutras, it's so very important to remain humble. If you feel that puffed upness that, oh, I'm going to, uh, or I have, I'm going to make, I don't know, that power trip that can come with the spiritual, let it go. And be wary of students that, as was the case with me, and remains periodically the case with me, is that I'll sort of get a little bit carried away with my imagination and to be humiliated by the universe, speaking through our colleagues and peers, speaking even through our own students and family, That's a blessed reminder of Patanjali's insight here, that no matter how great you may think you are, and at the same time, no matter how wretched you may think you are, neither pertains. That untouchable seer that dwells within and observes from without beyond praise, beyond blame, beyond knowing, beyond naming. And as you move through life, cherish that 
responsibility. Acknowledge. You can do your best. It will never be enough for everybody. It will never be enough even for your own sense of worth and purpose. Because all of that reconnoitering, all of that concern, sometimes anxiety, all of that resides at the level of fluctuation. So whether it's an elevated, sustained bliss fluctuation, or it's a lower, humble type of self-criticism or just simply a yearning for things to be a little bit different, whether vaunted or in a place of difficulty. Fluctuations fluctuate. The seer simply sees. All purposes are known due to the mind being tinted with seer and seen, speckled with innumerable habit patterns. All actions are presented for the purpose of the seer. Drashter, Dershya, Uparaktam, Chittam, Sarva, Artam. Drashter, Dershya, Uparaktam, Chittam, Sarva, Artam. Drashter, Dershya, Uparaktam, Chittam Sarva Artam Tad Asamkeya Vasana Bihish Chitram Api Para Artam Samhatya Karitvat Tad Asamkeya Vasana Bihish Chitram Api Para Artam Samhatya Karitvat Tad a samkeya vasana bihish chitram api para artam samhatya karitvat. This collection of sutras brings us out of the realm of the silent unspeakable into the great mystery of why and how we find ourselves here. And with this elegant turn of phrase, opening drashter dershya, the seer and the seen, Patanjali states that of course we get all mixed up. This is the human condition. That our mind is filled with scene, 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 activity, 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 identification, objects, activities, more activities. And yet, through the rhythm of our breath, through the rhythm of our daily cycle, through the rhythm of the unfolding of weeks into months into years, those moments, whether recognized or not, where we go into that awareness of the drashter, we go into that awareness of that higher self, the Atman, we go into that sense of the Mahapurush, the great presence. Those moments give us a sense of purpose. 
those moments are present, by definition unspoken, in the midst of everything. There's a Sanskrit word called artha. And on the one hand, it's a very pedestrian word that merely talks about material things. And as we grapple for the many years, it took seven years to render the translation shared with you of the Yoga Sutra, and we would meet Wednesday night after Wednesday night after Wednesday night in an historic 19th century building in the heart of Amityville, New York. And we kept on cycling and circling back with this word arta. And on the one hand, we notice that different translators would translate the same word differently in various places. And we said no. Patanjali chose this word, this multivalent, multi-purpose word, with an enduring theme in mind. And the enduring theme throughout yoga that has become a little bit of a cultural trope globally now is that nothing happens without a purpose. That everything that enters the domain of human awareness, everything, every situation, every circumstance, every up, every down, has a purpose. And that purpose, ultimately, is to remind consciousness of consciousness Again, I have to use some paradoxical self-canceling language there. But the idea is that whatever happens provides an occasion of experience that regarded considerately and traced back to its places of origin can and perhaps ultimately will allow that experience of apavarga, will allow that experience of moksha, will allow that experience of naroda or nirvana, will allow an experience of prajna, will allow an experience of ritta. Okay, so many different words about those moments where we are called into quiet, those moments where we go into a place of discernment, where we go into that cave of silence, where that purpose has, in fact, been fulfilled. Nietzsche talked about going under, going into that place of the eternal return, and with that rather heroic language, he alludes to what we see spoken of by Patanjali, that our journey is not without meaning. We journey, in the words of Carl Jung, within a realm of symbols. In Sankhya, in yoga, in Indian philosophy, those symbols become typologized into three, tamas, rajas, and sattva, so that each narrative can be interpreted through this philosophical prism, whereby, oh, I don't feel so good. Why do I want to feel so good? Oh. So I can remember, it doesn't matter if I don't feel so good. Oh, I'm really busy, I'm really busy. I have to do this, I have to do that. Why am I doing all of this? So I can remember that that's not really who I am. And likewise, oh, bliss. Why? So I can remember, no, that's not important. 
Now what happens through this journey, through symbol, through the scene, through activity, through the parinama, that bowing out through the outflow of the five sensory organs, through the outflow and the connection with the elements of the five motor organs. Okay, all of that creates this speckling, chitram, a vasana of impressions that add up to an experience that you can name and claim as your life. And as yoga teachers, you can do that for your own life. You could just make a little chart of you and say, oh, I went to school. Maybe you finished school, maybe you didn't. Ultimately doesn't matter. Oh, I discovered yoga. And you might want to keep a running list of the different traditions of yoga that have informed you. And then you can say, oh, I became a yoga teacher, and you might want to list out the different places where you've taught, and that's one piece of your life. And then on another page, you might want to make a little bit of a family tree. Even talk. If your grandparents are still alive, find out a little bit more about that whole family world. And if you're blessed with children or even grandchildren, interview them and find out what they most appreciate about their life, perhaps about the family or what annoys them the most, particularly if they're, if they're teenagers. And get a little sense of that. And then be aware of the chitra vasana, of all of the different factors that go in to the composition of a life. And then a pattern might emerge, a pattern that returns us again to this word called artha, this word of purpose. And in moments of considered reflection, and note, you've been given some tools just now of how to do a dharana on the vichara, and a little bit perhaps on the vitarka, on your path and on the stuff along the way of your path, that could turn into a bit of a meditation that could bring you to the aha moment of samyama, culminating in a state of truly seeing things up close as they are, and then experiencing from deep down a sense of abiding appreciation that all of this we do to glorify and to point toward, to appreciate, to quietly acknowledge that indwelling place of still, that indwelling place of silence. We work again and again and again. We breathe, breath followed by breath, followed by breath. We engage in a whole realm of diverse activities. We go hither and yon. And through yoga, we're invited to understand the vasana. We're invited through considered reflection on biography to literally get our bearings. Remember from the first part, Urtambhara, that we need to bear, we need to hold 
borrow. We need to hold all of the circumstances that create not only who we think we are, but who others have come to regard us to be. One of the beauties of yoga, going back to the metaphor of the pond, is that you're able, through self-understanding, through self-exploration, to still the waters. You're able, through intimate familiarity with your own set of fluctuations, prompted by your samskaras, prompted by your vasanas, you're able to allow that to settle. And from, imagine yourself drifting quietly on a raft in the middle of the pond that is your own life, you're able to regard that shore. You're able to see and identify, oh, that little cove, oh, that's where this pond is fed by a spring. Oh, if I take a look in this direction, there's some tall, perhaps maple trees to the north. And if I look and spin around a little bit, there may be some oak trees to the south. And if you abide on this metaphorical pond long enough through the day and into the night, you'll see the sunrise to the east. You'll notice if you're in the northern hemisphere, the fullness of light from the southern sky. As you float on this still pond, you'll see the sun setting to the west. And depending upon the time of month, full moon might rise, new moon might rise, or not, only a crescent and then no moon. And on that blessed night, you could see the whole stars rotate around that northern pole star if you're in the northern hemisphere. And then this feeling of the metaphorical pond gone to a place of stillness allows you, by naming the oak tree, by naming the maple, by identifying the stream entering, all metaphor, all symbol, perhaps for your mother or for the great mother, perhaps for your father or your metaphorical father. And as you look at all of the vegetation that surrounds your individual pond, there, if you have them, can be the stories of your siblings. There can be the stories of your teachers. There can be the great heroes from literature, as well as the demons from literature that have informed you and shaped you, there you will see the collective assembly of all that you have experienced and appreciate that which is seen. Interrogate it, ask, why were you here? What purpose did you serve in my life? How, as I see you in my memory, how can I honor what you have given me? And in this, in this figuration of the purpose of the scene, where do we find meaning? Not out there, but we find meeting here, surrounding us. And we allow 
their meaning to bring us to that still point. We allow that meaning to bring us to the inner cave experienced in the hold of the exhaled breath. And we cherish the particularity of that very specific journey of life, which is yours and yours alone. Yoga values the individuality. Yoga values the things, the real things, the vastus and the vishayas, the things that compose the granularity of our experience. Yoga values this ascent into a place of calm, experienced by each in her or his own particular way. Celebrate the scene. Interrogate the scene. Why are you here? Appreciate the things in your life. Appreciate the history of your life. You will ascend to a place of quiet. You will ascend with dignity claiming your purpose. The cultivation of self-becoming is discontinued by one who sees the distinction between actions and the seer. Then, Inclined toward discernment, the mind has a propensity for freedom. Vishesha, darshana, atma, bhava, bhavana, vinivirtihe. Vishesha, darshana, atma, bhava, bhavana, vinivirtihe. Vishesha, darshana, atma, bhava, Bhavana vinivirtihe. Tada viveka nimnam kaivalya pragbaram chittam. Tada viveka nimnam kaivalya pragbaram chittam. Tada viveka nimnam kaivalya pragbaram chittam. Patanjali invites us to consider, to consider, and to consider. As we gain a little bit of skill in seeing the distinction between all of the variegated karmas, vasanas, samskaras, all of that variegated action unfolding, in contrast to that quiet, to that stillness, to that unspoken, unspeakable awareness. The whole notion of going out, doing more. The whole notion of getting more stuff, 
the whole notion of gathering even yet more experiences goes into a place of vini vertehe, goes into a place wherein you just say, discontinue, I'm going to pull back from all of those vrittis. And rather than the cultivation, the bhavana of being bhava, don't need to do that anymore. Don't need to do that anymore. Now, the word bhava, so elegant, so laden with so many variations of meaning, and clearly, in choosing this word, Patanjali works in tandem with the Sankhya theory of the seeds of impulse. And in Sankhya, there are two major varietals of thinking about bhava. One of them has 50 parts, a little bit too complicated for this short lecture, but the other has eight parts. And those eight parts are syzygetic, meaning that they have one side and another side. They have a side that brings one down into tamas, and they have a side that conduces towards sattva. So we begin with powerlessness and power, anaishvarya and aishvarya. And one of the bhavas that we inhabit is either, oh, I can't do that, a bhava of weakness, or the bhava is, sure, I'm up for the task. The second is, oh, I want that attachment. And the other says, oh, I, don't, I, I can do without that, non-attachment. The third is grounded in ignorance, ajnana, also known as avidya, that ignorance that's at the core of all klishta karmas, at the core of not understanding the impermanence, the no-self of things, the ignorance of becoming egotistic, becoming attracted, almost addictive, the ignorance of hatred, the ignorance of, I got to keep on doing this, okay, all of that, tamasic, counterbalanced with the wisdom that I am not. I'm not this. I don't really do anything. I don't really own anything. That's the bhava that liberates. And yet there's two more. Another bhava is the bhava of always going to the inappropriate, always doing what you know you really shouldn't do, and that's the tamasic side. And then the other side, the dharma side, is that, yeah, this is who I am in life. This is what I uphold. This is what I stand for. And the notion within this system is that from those subliminal vasana categories called bhavas, through our personality, we manifest with our mind, through the senses, through the action organs of the body, we take up various identities, we take up various roles, we create various worlds. We cultivate, we bhavana, we allow it to flow forth through that movement of parinama, 
through acknowledging and doing and being and holding one world, another world, a different world. We create this amazing life through our desire, through our considered sequential behaviors until we begin that inquiry, that questioning. Hey, I've been doing this for a long time. Does it really give me that place of quiet? Or I've been doing this for a long time and now it's different. And as we look back on childhood, for me, it was Tootsie Rolls. Loved those Tootsie Rolls. Had to have those Tootsie Rolls. You could either chew them or let them dissolve. You could fill your whole mouth with that just pool of chocolate and sugar. A lot of cavities, but loved those Tootsie Rolls. And then when I was a teenager, Tootsie Rolls didn't really go there anymore. There was no longer a cultivation of that bhava from childhood of the Tootsie Roll loka, the Tootsie Roll world. And this also happens that just by maturity, we can discontinue something that we once cherished. Now what happens is that with experience, with hard knocks, with those occasional retreats into that space, into those places, those internal places, and those wonderful places of a quiet room, or a visit with an insightful friend or family member, or those places in the mountains or by the ocean, or those places simply in the immediacy of one's backyard or even patio, that those, for the yogi, for the person of goodwill, the sadhu, for those who have that inclination to value something that is quiet, something that holds higher or greater purpose, then a discernment can come about. This discernment is called viveka. This discernment allows people to go to the place heralded in the Upanishads of naeti, neti, na iti, na iti. It's not really this. The Tootsie Roll, boy, that was not only a transient experience, but it ultimately yielded a legacy of tooth pain and then the repair of the tooth pain, which is its own ordeal, and then even an implant, which is a multi-month ordeal to undo something that had started with an innocent childhood love of candy. So this cascade, again, through experience, into Viveka, discernment, gives one the tools to implement Vinivirti, ni Vinivirti, no more na vritti, no more fluctuations, Fluctuations serve the dual purpose of providing experience, often an experience tinged with a little bit of pain, with a little bit of dukkha, with often a big dose of disappointment. And then through that discernment, knowing that it's better to say, oh, I can walk away from that, that's not going to make it 
wonderful forevermore. That video game experience, and not only is it fleeting, but I'm recalling driving down the highway when my son was seven years old. And this was an era before the internet made video games really ethereal and ubiquitously available when you actually had to go to a store, not only buy the hardware, but you also had to buy physically the software. And there was this wonderful shop that was enticing people to come in and buy all of the stuff that you needed to have a video game experience in the early 90s. And my son looked over and he said, with a fair amount of wisdom, he said, Dad, I just don't get it. Why people spend all that money and spend all that time just to get control over their television set. And I was happy because that seven-year-old had used that logic that dawns in the human person around the age of seven of being able to figure it out, being able to sort it out. And that discernment, that move to the vinivrti, the move toward quelling the fluctuations, that sort of discernment repeatedly applied can lead to that place of elevation, can lead to that place of freedom. Now, as you work with your yoga students, Invite them to contemplate, to bring back from memory, and invite them to cultivate, to actually go out in search of places and moments where they quite literally can rise above. In my own life, in my own narrative, having grown up on the plains south of Lake Ontario, having not really seen a true mountain until in my 20s I ventured to the Himalayas, long before I'd even seen the Rocky Mountains. What I found that I cherish is climbing a mountain and then simply looking down. And that becomes a physical manifestation of the metaphor of becoming truly the seer. I can see for miles and miles and miles from that ascent. And one of my cherished activities, really just about every morning, is to walk out through my neighborhood, and if it's a clear day, I'll go up to that vantage point where I can see for 100 miles, and I can see out from that vantage point, Saddleback Mountain, Mount Jacinto, San Gorgonio, Mount Baldy, Mount Wilson, Mount Washington, the Santa Monica Mountains, and feel sort of a sense of lordship, of ownership, of emplacement, but feel that sense of remove. And every spring, sometimes also in the fall, and making pilgrimage to Joshua Tree, I'll rise up early, climb up, generating heat and tapas in the ascent of Mount Ryan, rise a mile high above sea level and look out over the Salton Sea, look backward toward San Gorgonio and Mount Baldy, look forward out to the Chocolate Mountains, 
and then do a full 360 and feel, literally, to quote an old movie, top of the world. And that just gives an analogical glimpse of the possibilities of human awareness and that feeling of ascent to freedom. So encourage your yoga students to go out into nature, to play with sleeping out under the stars, to find a place wherever they may be that they can get a little bit of an elevation and get a little bit of a broader perspective of what can be seen. Now recall from childhood when the ice flows would build up in Lake Superior and they would crash down through these bundles of ice, through Lake Michigan, through Lake Huron, through Lake Erie. Recall, everything drains out the St. Lawrence Seaway, but the last large lake, our lake, Lake Ontario, in the coldest part of winter, January into February, would just chunk up with these remarkable ice mountains. And we would go down there as a family with the dog, and we would climb up onto those ice flows, onto those ice mountains, and then just look back at the shore and look out to the part of the lake that wasn't frozen and get a sense of what it means to be part of something large, to be part, in this instance, literally of a flow, in this case, an ice flow, and to feel that frozen alacrity that comes in that moment of winter where you so cherish the warmth of your dog, you so cherish the warmth of your winter clothes, you so appreciate those boots that keep your feet dry and warm. And those sorts of moments become for each and every one of us, each in our unique way, the analog for what it means to be free. Thanks for listening to this episode of Professor Chapel's lecture series about the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Discover more episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on podcast.glo.com. I'm Derek Mills.